Hey there, Calc 3 folks back here with uh, another quick le lecture over multiple integration in our study of multiple integration here where we're uh, going to look at the case for a triple integral in what we know as uh, the sphere spherical coordinate system here. Uh, and I do start off by noting that not only can we rep represent position in three-dimensional space using a rectangular coordinate like x, y, and z, or a cylindrical coordinate like r, comma, theta, comma, z, right? We can also define location in three-dimensional space using a spherical coordinate, which would be noted as rho, phi, theta, right? And I think I called this, this is a r, theta, z, and this is rho, phi, theta, right? Where, if we think about what rho, phi, and theta describe, right? If a radial arm passes through the origin of R3 and the location rho, phi, theta equal to rho 1, comma, phi 1, comma, theta 1, and I'm going to go down here to explain out these values, right? This would probably be the better place to explain these values. Right. If a radial arm right, passes through the origin in our system and this location here at rho 1, comma, theta 1, comma, phi 1, right, rho 1 will be the distance along that radial arm. The point is from the origin. Phi 1 will measure the angle that forms between this radial arm from the origin and through our coordinate and what is known as the positive z-axis, right? And theta 1 will describe a similar measurement to what we saw back in polar coordinates or in cylindrical coordinates. If we were to translate this radial arm and this location on that point down into the two-dimensional space described by the xy plane, Theta 1 would be the angle formed between that translation of the radial arm into these two dimensions, right? Theta 1 has a very similar description to what we saw back in its description of a cylindrical coordinate, right? Uh, it's phi and rho now, rho and phi here, that are new to this description of position, all right? Again, rho being that distance from the point to our origin, and phi being this angle measurement that forms between the radial arm passing through these points and the positive z-axis, all right? That is describing this location here, right? That is describing this location in three-dimensional space, right, using what we call spherical coordinates, a coordinate that resembles a spherical nature, right? As for how rho, phi, and theta relate to x, y, and z in this system, we do have this relationship here, right? x will always be rho times the sine of phi times the cosine of theta. y will always be rho times the sine of phi times the sine of theta. And z will always be described by rho times the cosine of phi. Where when we think about rho in these calculations, rho, that distance, can actually be any real number. A lot like the value r in the polar coordinate system, it can be positive and negative in direction, right, in terms of its description of uh, direction from the origin, right? Where now what we do see is a similar measurement for theta, where theta, again, is this angle measurement that can form between this radial arm translated to the xy plane and the positive x-axis, which can be anything starting at zero and all the way around in that plane around to two pi in value. Whereas for phi, phi is a real number, right? 
that exists somewhere between zero and pi in value. All right? Phi that helps to denote this location, but can be no more than, or well, can be no less than the value of zero, and can be no more than the value of what would be just pi units away. All right? Where would, which would point down directly straight down the negative z axis, right? Once phi rotates through more than an angle measurement of pi, it actually could be described uh, as using the smaller angle uh, that forms between it and the positive z axis, right? The largest phi can be with its constraints is from zero to pi, all right? As for how the spherical coordinates relate back to the rectangular, the one key one that we take note on is that rho squared is always equivalent to x squared plus y squared plus z squared in value. And as for phi and theta, you do have to use a little right triangle trigonometry, right? You have to use a little right triangle trigonometry to break down what would be our measurement for x y and z, right, or how would theta and phi relate to this location with respect to x, y, and z. That would require a little right triangle trig, right, and we, we don't see those formulas that often and they do vary at times based upon the given information. So we uh, have just a really a generic statement there in that relationship, all right. As for calculating, though, a triple derivative, right, this triple integral, sorry, triple derivative, the triple integral of a multivariable function with respect to the volume, right, in the context of the spherical coordinate system, we rely on this following theorem. All right, folks, you may have noticed some variables jump about here. I noticed a copy paste here so look yeah again here um, this theorem states um, that if we assume f is continuous over some region d containing three-dimensional space where d now is defined by this set of spherical coordinates in r3 where theta theta being that angle right that we're familiar with in the description of this location from cylindrical coordinates, if it's any angle between alpha and beta, and phi, phi is any angle between A and B, right? And rho, rho is any, what? A value bounded between functions of phi and theta, then since x is equal to rho sine phi cosine theta, y is equal to rho sine phi sine theta, and z is equal to rho cosine phi, our triple integral over our region D for function f with respect to the volume of the solid D, right, in three-dimensional space, is given by this calculation here where you will note this calculation is going to happen in the order d rho, d phi, d theta. Theta being our outermost integration that happens across the bounds from alpha to beta, across those angle measurements from alpha to beta. Phi defines our region D and is our middle integration here that occurs across the angles from A to B. And rho defines that distance from the origin to the uh, coordinate in our system, to all these coordinates in region D, defined as functions of phi and theta. All right? Where we are going to have to integrate with respect to this very specific order, d rho, d phi, d theta. All right? Where, you'll notice then if we go into our integrand, right? In our integrand, function f, which used to be in terms of x, y, and z, needs to have its x value, its y value, 
and its z value replaced with these arguments involving rho, phi, and theta. Right? Those arguments involving rho, phi, and theta that relate rho, phi, and theta to x, y, and z respectively. And then, as we've seen in other variable changes, or other changes in variables within our integration, we do often have this other factor that we have to multiply our integrand by. This is known as the Jacobian factor. And here we see a Jacobian given by a rho squared sine of phi. All right. If we get a chance to study that Jacobian, we will see that in this particular transformation, due to this relationship between x, y, and z, and rho, phi, and theta, we're going to produce a Jacobian value uh, in this transformation for the change of variables in this integration, given by uh, rho squared times the sine of phi. Now this is just an extra factor that's going to incorporate itself into the integrand along with the translated value of f into terms of rho, phi, and theta using these relationships given above. All right. Now, in the spherical coordinate system, some of the most fundamental shapes we encounter right, are portions of spheres and conical descriptions. Right, portions within cones. What we take note here is I do give us an example. I say here, consider the calculation of this triple integral in the rectangular context over a region D in three-dimensional space described by what we call the unit ball or the unit sphere. All right, another way we could call this is the unit sphere. Right? which is really just a sphere in our three-dimensional space centered at the origin with a radius of one unit. And you can see that's what I have illustrated here. This is centered at what we would think of as the origin of the system, and it has a radius of one unit. All right? This is what we call a unit sphere. All right? Now, we are integrating over the spherical region, hint, hint, right? Spherical coordinates might be applicable, right? Where they might certainly be more applicable for this calculation than trying to approach it back here in the rectangular context as we have it presented, right? If we think about region D in the rectangular context, right? We would have to perform that integration, right? For E raised to the negative X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared value, all raised to the power of three halves, right? Across this description of D, across bounds of D that actually are rather complex when describing a spherical shape. If we bring those descriptions up into view here. Note in the rectangular coordinate system, this is how we would describe this solid given above, the unit sphere. We would be bounded in the, what, xy plane here inside region R, which would put us between x values from negative 1 to 1, and within these semicircular regions, given by the square root of 1 minus x squared plus or minus, right? And then over this region of R, the circular region in space that we're defining here with x and y, we would be trapped between these two surfaces, right? The surface is given by plus or minus the square root of 1 minus x squared minus y squared. These values seen here in our rectangular context would have to become the bounds seen on D here. X would go from negative 1 to 1. Y would go from negative square root of 1 minus X squared to positive square root of 1 minus X squared. And then Z would be bounded between the square root, negative square root of 1 minus X squared minus Y squared and positive square root of 1 minus X squared minus Y squared, which would have to be integrating our, an integrand of this value seen here which you take note, that that is a rather complex triple integration if we set up D's description in this rectangular context. 
All right. So what we might consider doing, though, noting that in the spherical context, the sphere is a rather fundamental shape. All right. It's uh, basically a lot like having a description of a simple plane in the rectangular coordinate system. All right. A sphere is what? analogous to a simple plane in the rectangular coordinate system. Where if we consider this integral in the rectangular coordinate system, right, and what would describe region D, sorry, and I should say in the spherical coordinate system, we see with D defined by the coordinates phi, or rho, phi, and theta, rho, well, sorry, let's start with theta, theta, would be bounded between values from 0 to 2 pi, right? We notice this sphere forms with angle measurements that form along the x-axis in the xy plane, starting at 0 and all the way around that z-axis back to the location of 2 pi on the positive x-axis, right? Theta would form across the bounds from 0 to 2 pi. Phi would describe that angle measurements formed for all these locations, right? Starting at phi equal to zero, right up along the positive z-axis, all the way around that sphere down to pointing directly down the z-axis where phi would be equal to pi. And as theta cycles all the way from zero to two pi, and phi cycles all the way from 0 to pi to begin forming this sphere. Rho just is all the distances that start at the origin in the center of the sphere and are describing distances starting there at 0 and extending out to the edge of the sphere at a, uh, a distance of one unit away from the center. So as theta goes from 0 to 2 pi around these circles, perimeter around its equator, phi goes from 0 to pi along the, from I should maybe call the north pole of the sphere down to the south pole of the sphere. And as theta travels around the equator of the sphere and phi travels from the north pole to the south pole, we are a distance from the center of the sphere uh, anywhere from 0 units away up to a distance of 1 unit away. Right? This is a much simpler description if we consider putting these bounds right, into these locations in our triple integrals. We will notice we'll produce a triple integration that now is going to occur across constant bounds. We will have to make these adjustments, though, to our integrand, and we will have to integrate in this very specific order. Right? Now notice in our integrand, it involves x squared plus y squared plus z squared. And what do we know about x squared plus y squared plus z squared in the spherical coordinate system is that those values are equal to rho squared. And that's where we're going to kind of begin here. Let me get back in here, right? So if I bring this note into play, so if we think about this triple integral we're going to have to calculate, right? Since rho squared is again equal to x squared plus y squared plus z squared, we can replace this quantity in here with rho squared, which you'll notice then when raised to the 3 halves power, the square and the 1 half will cancel, right? Leaving you really minus rho cubed up there in that power, and that is where we kind of get started here. We can replace this with rho squared, and then that rho squared will cancel with the one half and the three halves when we multiply those two powers using our fundamental power rule. And what we're left with there is e to the negative p, rho cubed power, All right? Where we then have to incorporate this additional Jacobian factor, rho squared sine phi into our integrand calculation, and we see that incorporated still down here. 
And then we have to consider integrating first with respect to rho, this value of rho involved in the power of e here and in this Jacobian, and then with respect to phi involved here in the Jacobian, and then with respect to theta, where if you take note, all this is going to be a constant with respect to theta. All right? So if we start to set this up for rho, how would we approach that with rho? As you might know, we could use a little u substitution. All right? You can let u be this power on e. That will imply its derivative with respect to rho is negative 3p squared, and that involves p squared, which is hanging out here as part of our integrand. Right? So we're able to say with du, d rho equal to negative 3 rho squared, that must be imply that negative 1 third du is equal to rho squared d rho. So from u substitution, I can replace this quantity with u. I can place the u, uh, rho squared here, d rho, with negative 1 third du. All right? And then I make an adjustment to the bounds from 0 to 1 by substituting into this value here for rho. And a rho value is 0. This also produces a lower bound of 0. And a value of 1, 1 cubed times negative 1, results in negative 1 for a new upper bound. And you'll see that develop here. Here's that negative 1 third that comes from this part of the substitution. The first two integrals remain the same. We're only changing the bounds on the innermost integral first. From 0 to 1 to 0 to negative 1 using this result for u and understanding that these are values of rho. All right? This negative rho cubed gets replaced with the u, e to the u, and you'll notice the rho squared and the d rho have been replaced with du. That actually the negative one third du is what they get subbed out with. You still have that sine of phi in there, which is just a constant for the moment. Right? And if we consider integrating this integrand now with just respect to u, as I said, sine of phi is just a constant, this would be sine of phi e to the u. Right? Remember, the antiderivative of e to the x is e to the x. So the antiderivative of e to the u with respect to u is e to the u. Now, I also, I think, rearrange my bounds here. As I've noted in the past, I like to keep my bounds in order from least to greatest as if I can. Uh, so I rearrange the order here from 0 to negative 1 to negative 1 to 0, and that allows me just to switch this direction of the sign of negative 1 third. So that becomes positive 1 third here. The antiderivative of e to the u is e to the u, so we have e to the u sine phi, where we now evaluate across these bounds from negative 1 to 0, going into the value of u. Now e to the 0 is 1, so that's sine phi by itself when e u is 0. Now when u is negative 1, that would be e to the negative 1 or 1 over e sine phi. All right? So this produces the uh, new integral sine phi minus 1 over e sine phi. And if I bring that result in the view here, that's what we start off this left hand side with. as far up as I'm going to be able to take that. There we go. Got a little further. Put my equal sign back in. All right. So, all right. As we had noted, this is just going to become sine of phi minus 1 over e sine phi. That is the value of this innermost integral's antiderivative. The value here with respect the the uh, the integration with respect to rho, right? That's sine phi one over e minus one over e sine phi, where we could incorporate that one third into that result also. 
where I'm now going to integrate these two arguments of sine phi with respect to phi. I might factor out the sine phi first from both those terms, which will leave behind the constant 1 minus 1 over e. And you can see that's coming out in front here as a constant in our result. And then the antiderivative of sine phi is just negative cosine phi, which we now evaluate across those bounds from 0 to pi. At pi, it's going to be negative 1. So it's minus negative 1, which is positive 1. And at 0, it's positive 1. So it would be minus the negative of positive 1, which would be positive 1. It would be plus 1. It's 1 plus 1 inside here, folks. If you set that up watching, taking care of your signs, right? it would be 1 minus negative 1. You get 1 when you plug in the pi. You get negative 1 when you plug in the 0. And remember, you're taking the difference of those. So it does become 1 minus negative 1 or the value of 2. Which now 2 is just a constant. As we said, we're going to really just build up a constant until we get to theta. And at theta, we have this constant now integrated with respect to theta. Well, that's just going to be 2 theta. That 2 can come out in front as a constant multiple. 2 thirds one times the quantity 1 minus 1 over e times theta evaluated from 0 to 2 pi. And evaluating theta from 0 to 2 pi is just 2 pi. So the end result here is 2 pi times 2 thirds, which is 4 pi over 3 which I could distribute across this statement here, right? Uh, which would produce 4 pi over 3 minus 4 pi over 3e. And if I put that into a calculator, that's about 3.80355 units to the fourth power. Keep in mind what we are calculating here, folks, is a hypernet volume, right? We're calculating back here in this problem the hypernet volume right, trapped between this four-dimensional surface. There's, we don't really have a manner. We can look, start to look at the cross-sections of this, but we really don't have a way to visualize this fourth-dimensional surface off in four dimensions, but it's a hypersurface, and there is a hypernet volume forming between this four-dimensional surface and this three-dimensional solid, this three-dimensional unit sphere. There's a volume forming there, a hypernet volume. And we just calculated it. Going through this calculation, we find that that hypernet volume is about 3.80355 units raised to the fourth power. All right, folks. Uh, oh, then the last note I, I do bring into view is when is it appropriate to be using spherical coordinates? Well, with spheres, obviously, with portions of spheres, obviously, right? But also when dealing with cones, right? When looking at regions of space trapped within cones and spheres is going to be the time that you want to consider using um, the spherical coordinate system, right? Um, spheres and cones are kind of the fundamental way we define the spherical coordinate system. It, 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 it breaks up three-dimensional space using what we might think of as these concentric spheres, all centered at the origin, right, in a fundamental understanding, along with a bunch of uh, concentric, what we might call cones, all sharing a, a tip right at the origin. And uh, these cones forming along the x and y's axes in the positive uh, and negative directions, right? And really, I should be careful there. Uh, really, the cones are forming more along the z-axis uh, with their tips at the bases. Uh, but we could, however, orientate it always to some other uh, axes if needed. Be. All right. But again, when are these appropriate? When working with regions trapped within spheres and regions trapped within, within cones. And you will see that in these sections. Problems, folks.
right? So that does wrap up my uh, last video here uh, over triple integrals in um, different coordinate systems. We've looked at them in the rectangular coordinate system, we've looked at them in the cylindrical, and we've looked at them now in the spherical coordinate system, right? Uh, with respect to more videos, uh, you know, I'm going to try to push out a couple more related to some test ideas. Uh, but I think what you're going to see on the test, folks, really does cover up just up through what is currently here in a lecture a set of videos. Uh, if I provided you with any more videos over this Chapter 16 stuff, it would really be just an addition to uh, what we've discussed and what you see on the test. Um, you might look, you'd be able to apply some of those ideas. Like I said, I, I maybe want to talk about the Jacobian if I can. Um, and then there is some center of mass, which is just application of uh, some multiple integration. Really is, 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 you know, there's not much that I can develop there other than, than getting into the formulas for center of mass. So you may not see, see something over center of mass. My priority would actually be on the Jacobian, right? I, I maybe want to spend a little time there uh, with how did, how did we incorporate, um, where does this factor come from? in this, where's that theorem at? Let me get down to it here, right? Where does this Jacobian factor come from? That's what I, I really want to come and spend some time with. Uh, the center of mass stuff is really just application, folks. Um, and it's a quick formula, right? It's a quick formula. I say that in terms of it's a quick formula to present or to present yourself with. Uh, in terms of calculation, it can be a little hairy because it does involve some multiple integration in the process. Right, and it does involve multiple, multiple integrations in the process. So, uh, you might want to be looking at 16.6 on your own, but I I'd probably do want to come back and look at some of the this uh, change of base idea and where this Jacobian comes from. All right, uh, and then we'll be back into s chapter 17. That's where we're going to plan to finish the semester. And if you notice in your book, that's the last chapter, and we're just going to kind of make a running start at the end here, folks. Uh, there are some ideas that we need to talk about in Chapter 17, uh, looking at uh, the vector calculus, and then there's some ideas that we can kind of skip over. And, and I'll, I'll help direct your focus there through some of the videos. But I hope you're doing well. I hope you're hanging in there. Uh, you know, I hope this makes you feel a little normal, these, these lecture videos. And I've also been putting together some demos to help you out with all this understanding. So make sure you're checking those out, too. I do definitely give you some ways to kind of check your work and help you manage your studies here and, and help you out in terms of just getting through all this. So I hope you're taking advantage of it all and you're using your time wisely, folks. And um, this will all be over, I hope, very, very soon. So uh, I'll see you all then.